Bibles and go over to the book of John, John chapter 6, um, this morning, John chapter 6, verses 38 through 40 is where I'll be this morning. And uh, talking about the submission of Christ, and of course last week I started on uh, the sonship of Christ and how He was the only begotten Son of God, He, he was the Son, and it's not that He was made the Son, we were made the children of God, but He was always and will be the Son of God and is God, and that's the amazing thing. But here as we get into the uh, book of John here and other parts of the Scripture, looking at the submission of Christ, uh, we realize we got a long ways to go. I wish I could say this morning that my feet were pointed in the right direction all the time. I wish I could say my thoughts were always thinking the right things, and my heart always had that spirit of charity and love, and uh, there's never been a harmful thing or a wrong spirit or any such thing as that in my heart and my life. But of course we all know, every one of us deal with this issue of submission. And so we got to constantly go to the Word of God, constantly got to depend upon the Spirit of God and say, uh, Lord, you, you know what a wretched I was before you even saved me and thank God for that. But Lord, you got a lot. You got a lot of work on your hands when you got me. So, uh, let's look at here, John chapter six, verse thirty-eight through forty, and just these few verses as we get started out. He says, "For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of Him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, and of all which He hath given to me, that I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. This is the will of Him that sent me that." Everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. And of course we understand that if they can't even submit to the very first uh, part of this, verse 40 in itself, he says, He that everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life. If they haven't submitted to this, then everything else is out the window. And we first got to realize our need of salvation, our need to come to Christ and say, Lord, you, you have to do all of the work. You have to do all the saving. Lord, it's all of you. Because we know that you're the only way to salvation and you're the only way to, to have the life that I need to have in order to live in a way that's in complete obedience to you. And so it's got to start with that. It's got to start with everlasting life and then move on to our walk, and, uh, which we'll get to. Lehman Strauss said, complete obedience to, um, look at this here, get this out the way, sorry. Give me a minute here. Anyway, this is, I told my wife, I said pray for me, I want to bring this iPad up here and try to use it and then look, look at what happens. I mess up. This thing has constant problems sometimes. Uh, but uh, Lehman Strauss said, complete submission to the Father's will is the lodestone of Christ's attractiveness. He is the perfect example of that which is consistently taught. His spotless character was adorned with the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit as he taught by the word of and word by the life, the need for humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God and submitting to His will. And uh, no one modeled submission more or even uh, lived a life in submission more than our Lord. We understand that. You know, when we come to the Word of God, we understand that every word that God, Jesus spoke, and He would tell us, in the, whether it's in the Gospel of John or one of the other Gospels, He said, these words are not my own words. Every single word that I'm speaking to you this morning is coming from the Father. The words that I speak are my Father's words. And the works that I'm doing, they're not my own works, they're the works of the Father that's given me to do. And a lot of times, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but this is what we got to realize. He, he, he was so much in submission to the, the Father that He completely abandoned Himself to whatever God's will was. And we remember that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. One of the remarkable verses we find here in the book of Hebrews chapter uh, 10 verse 7. And I want to turn it over there real quick so I can read it from the Bible. But Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7, it says this. <clears throat> it says, Then said I, and this is referring to Christ, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it's written to me, to do thy will, O God, above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings, 
offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither have pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come in the, to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Now, obedience here, we, we see Jesus, he's completely submissive in every sort of way, form, and fashion. I wish that Saul would have learned that long ago when Samuel came up to him and he's offering that sacrifice before he goes into the battle when he was supposed to be waiting for Samuel to offer his sacrifice. And even afterward, when he brings forth the, the, the sheep and so forth, and he says, what means the bleeding of the sheep? And he talks about, oh, well, I want to give all this to God. Well, he says, God wants our obedience. He's not concerned about the sacrifice. He wants our obedience more than bringing all the burnt offering and all the sacrifices and everything. He desires our heart, and I've said that time and time again. But simply stated, we could come to this verse in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, and, and look at it when he says, in the volume of the book that's written to me, what's the volume of the book? It's the Bible. And so it's from cover to cover, from page to page, every single word that is highlighted from the Word of God. This is Christ's complete submission and obedience to God in every sort of, every way. And we'll look at that more and more. But from cover to cover, only Christ could live it. Whatever the Spirit was, whatever the will of God was, only Christ perfectly fulfilled that. And uh, what a testimony that is. A guy by the name of Louis Newton spoke at a funeral of George W. Truett. Anybody know who that is? He's an old Southern Baptist preacher from years gone by, mostly around the turn of the century, the 20th century, 1900s. And I believe he died around 1930, 30-something is when he passed away. So it's been years ago, but uh, about a guy by the name of Louis Newton, he was called to speak there at the funeral, and uh, he was talking about this man and the great life that he lived. And he said, two texts emerge uh, every time that I think of George Truett. He said, the first is found in that uh, pattern prayer which our blessed Savior and Lord gave us in the Gospel of Matthew, Thy will be done. Every time one asks for the explanation of this marvelous and amazing man, the answer is given fully and finally in these four one-syllable words is found in the Gospel of Matthew, Thy will be done. Uh, he said, uh, he would say at that time that he heard George Truett say a thousand times, the will of God is safe, it's right, and it's always best. And then he said the other text that exemplifies the life here of George Truett, uh, was the, the found in Philippians 3.10. He says that I might know Him. And I would love it if every single one of us, every single church member, every single person that's ever been born, by the, born again by the grace of God, uh, every single preacher could say without an sh absolute shadow of a doubt, somebody would come up and maybe give a eulogy or maybe tell about my life that he would be able to say, I could say one thing about Henry Funkhauser or one thing about Carol Kuhn or one thing about Ed West or, or, or one of the other church members that are here, the Splawns or the, uh, the Swains, whatever the case may be, they could say of our lives, the, the one thing that I know about him and, and, and what is said of Henry and what's said of, uh, of this person or the other person who's been saved by the grace of God is he would always live this verse, Thy will be done, and that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings may make conformable unto his death. And that's what I want said of you, that's what I want said of me and for every person who's been saved by the grace of God. Romans tells us about living this perfect life and submission and obedience to Christ. And he tells us and one of the ways and how to do it, he goes in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that's the Apostle Paul. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He says, in other words, I'm not asking of you anything that's unreasonable. I know that you can't live uh, the way that you ought to on your own. The flesh, as he tells us in Romans chapter 7, is, is fighting against the Spirit. The two are contrary one against another. The things that I want to do, I find myself not being able to do. But it's only by the Spirit of God working in me and through me as I give myself and yield my members of instruments of righteousness unto God, living for Him the best way that I know how, presenting my body a living sacrifice, uh, 
is the only way we'll be able to prove what is that acceptable and perfect, uh, perfect will of God. And I like that. I like that it's, it's not of us. I, I'd mess it up time and time and time again. And, uh, but we find that same, that same sort of mindset, that same sort of attitude uh, modeled there in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, as I've already spoken about our Lord. Because we can see that, that fulfilling of that will of God by the Word of God. We can see that sacrifice that was given. Christ given Himself a sacrifice for us. And so He tells us to present our bodies a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. Christ was that sacrifice for us. His blood shed on the cross for our sins. And, and so I don't need to give myself a, as a, a sacrifice. I don't have to presently, physically, give myself to die upon a cross. Christ died for me, but it's me living through Christ. He says, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And that's the way that we ought to live and, and give ourselves in fulfilling the will of God. Of course, that second verse, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, the only way that I can live is my mind is renewed as I concentrate and meditate upon the Word of God and I get into it and, and, and I try to live it. Not to my own ability, but to the ability of Christ living through me and trying to uh, rework everything that I've learned and everything that I thought that I knew and just and get rid of my stinking thinking and my carnal way of living and say... Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 say it more perfectly than anything that I could ever express to you. But it's me getting out of the way. Not leaning my own understanding, but leaning upon God and His will and His way. But submission is a word uh, that, that we fail to realize exactly what it is. I, I can admire the life that Christ lived in complete submission to, to the will of the Father. But we also need to live it as well. He says, For whoever should do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. So, submission. Let's, let's try to define that real quick. A pastor is a man who ought to do what? Rule his own house. Of course, he's got to rule, rule his own temper, his own mind. I mean, everything. When I get into 1 Timothy chapter 3, and it tells me that a pastor ought not to be a brawler, but he ought to be sober-minded and grave and, and of an even temper. That tells me I've got to rule my own, my own spirit. I've got to keep it in submission to Almighty God, but not only uh, my own self, my own spirit, but the word submission here, I find it mostly portrayed within the home. And I'll look at several others as well. Because when we look at the home, the pastor is a man who's got to keep his children in subjection, knowing how to rule his own house. That's what it tells us. Because if he knew not how to rule his own house, what does it say afterwards? Huh? Right. How shall we know how to rule? How shall we take care of the church of God? Wives are submit themselves to their husbands. Ephesians 5 and uh, 1 Peter, we, we see that given there. 1 Peter chapter 3. But the common misunderstanding is that we think that uh, submission means to constantly rule over, I'm in charge. It's what I say. It's what I want that goes. But when we come to the Scripture, there's a completely different understanding when it comes to the idea of submission for a wife. It's not just what I say goes, even though that I have the last say. And I'll stand before God for what goes on in my house. But my wife has my help me. She's there to help me, to encourage me, to, to show me um, to help me, to encourage in all these sort of ways. But um, we go over to Ephesians chapter 5, and, and, and I notice over in Ephesians chapter 5, how many verses are given to the submission of the wife? One, maybe two. It's actually one, but if you factor in First Peter chapter 3, you say, well, there's, there's two or three verses doing, dealing with the submission of the wife. But how many verses are dealing with the love of the husband for the wife? A lot more in comparison. So we are come to understand that my love for my wife is a lot more 
It's more vitally important that I love my wife, love my children as I ought to, than it is talking about the submission of the wife. I'm not, I'm not taking away she ought to submit. In fact, when we look at 1 Timothy, he even talks about how we ought to, uh, even in the church, it says women ought to learn in silence. And, and, and that sort of um, understanding that's given there out of the Word of God. It's God that says it, don't get offended at me, but get, uh, understand the Word of God here. But it's that submission that we bring ourselves under that, that, that God wants us to understand. Children are to obey their parents, for that's right in the Lord. And uh, again, the husband, he's responsible to God for ruling the house. Um, think of the lack of submission. When they gave place, Adam and Eve gave place to the devil in the Garden of Eden. When Eve, if she would have submitted to her husband... And of course, he's standing by. He wasn't what he ought to have been either. I'm not giving him uh, a way out. But if Eve would have, instead of talking to the devil, would have been submissive unto Adam, and Adam would have been submissive unto the, the Father, unto God Himself, and following the will of God, and keeping every single word that God had told him to, and, and learning because he says, you know, that shall not eat of this, this tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because the day that you eat thereof, you'll die. It's not that, uh, that, that, that God wanted to take away from Adam, that he wanted to hurt him or harm him. In fact, the, the idea of submission is God knows what's best for us. But if they would have followed that, that line of submission, the home would have been a whole lot better. And I'll tell you the truth. Everyone would be a whole lot better by submission to God. I mean, it's one thing to submit in home. It's one thing to submit to uh, the leadership in the church, but submitting to God and make our lives a whole lot better. But we move on from the idea of submission in the home, but submission in the church. It says that Christ is what? He's the head of the church. Colossians 1.18, He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that... And all things he might have the preeminence, and I like that. And it's not that it gives me a way out because I'm responsible for leading the church as the pastor, but it's God's the one who is doing the leading, the one who knows everything, the one who's working out everything for our good, the one who is all powerful in the church, directing and governing and uh, having the preeminence. So we're to keep his commands, right? He tells us over and over again in 1 John and other places, the book of John itself. He says, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. So our submission in the church is motivated by faith, and living out this word, keeping it, hope, knowing that what God has for us is far better than what we want for ourselves, and love. And all that will result in that self-sacrifice that we ought to have for the body of Christ. Now think of this, God gave some in the book of Ephesians, He says He gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. That's, that's what God says. And who are all those people that I listed out for you? That's the leadership of the church. And these are the ones that were told in Hebrews chapter uh, 13, I believe it is, that we ought to obey for they watch over your souls. But that's the leadership of the church and, and there's a role of submission to the leadership. It's not that they know everything, it's not that they're perfect, but again, they are submitted unto Almighty God. And uh, we have a privilege, I count it a privilege at least, to stand before you and preach the Word of God and to teach the Word of God. And, and I don't count it but a light thing. In fact, I know that I'm totally responsible for every single word that comes out of my mouth. We find this verse in Matthew chapter 20 as we move on, talking about the, the congregation, Matthew chapter 20, and I'm included in this, by the way, 25 through 28. It says, But Jesus called unto them, unto them, uh, them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. 
In other words, you know, we, a lot of people talk about greatness and how much, how great faith they have and everything else. He said, if you want to be great, you want God to, you want to be acknowledged for something that you did, get down and wash some feet. Get down and serve in the church. Get down and be busy as Christ was. And, and I'm coming down to, to Christ's submission. I'm getting there in just a few moments. But I'm just trying to give you a working definition uh, of, of this word of submission in all the ways that it's applied. And we're to submit ourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Not only for the home, the church, but also in the government. As we're told to pray for those in authority over us. Romans 13.1 talks about how we're to be subject unto the higher powers. It says, for there's no power to be but of God. And they're ordained of God. And think it not today, wield the sword in vain. And there are terror unto evil works, not unto good. And so, we're to live as good and productive citizens in the country. Uh, not only a word for the home, for the church, for citizens of a government, but if it's used of Christ as submission to the Father who is in heaven. And so I guess a good definition in my own words would be to do the will and wishes of the one who is an authority figure out of sincerity of our heart, dependence upon the Spirit, laying down our independence in order to serve and to please God, and I know that's a lengthy definition. And so this morning as we look into the submission of Christ, I want you to see how we must follow His example, Christ's example, not... It's Christ's example we must follow, submitting to the will of the Father, serving Him in gladness of heart. We sing the words, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. And usually when I ask you and invite you to sing with me, I hope that when we sing something, we sing it out of truth. Because these are the words we sing when we worship God. And we ought to mean it, as opposed to just singing it, and just letting it be just words. You see what I'm saying there? We're to be motivated by the person of Christ, who is perfectly submitted to Christ in every way, the Father in every way. Yeah, He did go to the cross. Yeah, He went to the cross for me. Yes, He suffered for me. But in the letter to the Philippian believers, Paul expounds on this glorious mystery is given in here. And uh, he, he tells us in, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5-8, through 8, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And he took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And that's one of the keys to submission and obedience. Humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And that was the greatest act of submission. Some years ago, the king of England, he was preparing. There was a war going on. I guess this was more toward maybe war, war, World War I, World War II. I, I don't know. I, not sure where the story comes out of, but the King of England laid aside all of his royal garments to the wayside and got to work in one of the defense factories and putting himself to work and helping the, the means of war so that the England could succeed. But here we find Christ, who's much greater. He lays aside not the royal garments of maybe an earthly king, but he lays aside the garments of of the glory that he had with the Father, lays him aside. He takes upon him the form of a man, the form of a servant, and uh, goes to war against those darkest enemies that you and I have, the, the enemy of sin and death, and fights against it, and overcomes by himself, of all things. Single-handedly, it makes us more than conquerors through him. And it's through his submission that we can be submissive ourselves during his time on earth, between infancy and exaltation to the right hand of the Father, Jesus would show us submission in many ways. We would think of it uh, only in terms uh, between God the Father and God the Son. But consider this, Christ submitted Himself to humanity. That's what I've been saying already. He submitted Himself to humanity. He set aside His place with God. He set aside His glory, His position, his honor with God to be a partaker, as it says in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, a partaker of flesh and blood like as you and I are. And so every 
time do we see Christ when he's hungering like we are, when he's tired like we are, when he's walking this earth like we are, when he's uh, being tempted and tried like we are. He understands what we're going through because he submitted himself to take on this, this flesh. He suffered like us. He was persecuted and oppressed like us. He says in one place, in one of the Gospels, I think it's John, and some of the disciples wanted to follow after him. He says, foxes have holes, the birds of the, ears have, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And so when a lot of people think that Christianity is supposed to be easy, apparently they've never read that verse. But he took on flesh and blood. He could have turned stones into bread, but he refused to do so. Not only did he take on submitting himself, taking on humanity, but he submitted himself to Mary and Joseph. Now that's an amazing thing. Given the responsibility to take care of this Christ child, submitted it into Mary's care and Joseph's care during this time. I call them uh, legal guardians more than anything else because it really wasn't that he was their parents because his parent was God, the Father. But submitted to the care, can you imagine of trying to take care of Christ when he could have came out and said, hey, your parenting skills are all wrong and all flawed and all messed up. You shouldn't be uh, belittling or you shouldn't be doing this or doing that. I can't imagine what it's like to try to raise Christ as a child. And yet the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2, he says that uh, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. And in and, and the verse uh, above that, he tells us he was subject unto his parents. Even when he's in the temple, when he's there and he's reasoning with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's talking to them out of the law of, of God and reasoning with them. And they're amazed at this doctrine, by the way, of a 12-year-old little kid. He's no ordinary man because he's the Christ man. And he says, no, you're not, that I must be about my father's business. This comes before th this area where he became subject unto him. And when his mother said, we saw you, sorry, how, how do you know I'm not about my father's business? But yet, he went along home with him. He submitted himself unto him. So, if Christ can submit himself to his parents, who's the son of God, and we can too. He submitted himself to John's baptism. And though John, he would be hesitant, he says, uh, Lord, you say you have need to be baptized of me? I'm not worthy to stoop down. I'm not even worthy uh, to do the, the lowest job, you know, to, to, to wash somebody's feet or to unhook some sandals. That was the job of a servant, the lowest person on the totem pole. And John says, I'm not even worthy to do the work of the basest of all servants, and you're asking to come to be baptized of me. And Jesus submits himself to that baptism. He tells John, he says, For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. He comes to identify himself with humanity and submitting to this baptism of John. Christ submitted himself to the Jewish ways and practices. At just eight, years, eight days old, eight days old, he does what he, his mother brings him into the temple to be circumcised according to the law. Every single former practice of any other Jewish boy, when they go and do their bar mitzvah and studying and learning the law and learning the trade of their father, that of a carpenter, uh, for Jesus at least, and all the ways in keeping the law, Jesus would submit himself to those feasts and festivals and the keeping of the law even beyond what anybody else would do. He fulfilled it down to the T. And without doing that, he could never be the Savior of men. Christ submitted himself to taxes. Uh, Jesus explained to Peter, one of the guys came to him and, and said, Oh, not you and your master, do you, do you guys agree to pay the temple taxes? And Peter says, without even thinking a word about it, he says, yeah. He goes to the house where Jesus is. Jesus meets him at the door and he says, uh, you know, what? Well, who are the ones that pay the taxes? Is it the children or is it strangers? And uh, he says, well, strangers. He said, then are the children free? But he says this, Notwithstanding, lest we should offend, give unto them for me 
and for thee. And he sends Peter out on a fishing trip. And again, I told you, he wasn't a very good fisherman. Uh, he says, go out there, cast out your line. You'll find a fish with a coin in his mouth. Go pay your taxes and pay taxes for me as well. He tells us another place when they're tempting him. He says, do you believe in paying taxes? He says, show me that coin that you have in your hand. Whose inscription is it? Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and render unto God the things that are God's. Uh, he submitted himself at Gethsemane, knowing the darkest hour had come, knowing that he had been betrayed. Jesus begins to pray in the garden of Gethsemane. He begins to pray with great sorrow and agony of heart. Luke uh, says this, he says, It was as sweat drops of blood as he's there praying. That's how much agony that he was in. Jesus says, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And he allowed himself to be taken. As he knows and understands that his hour has come, all the people were coming. Judas is on the way to betray him with a kiss. And he allows himself to be taken. Doesn't even put up a resistance. And even when they come to take him, he says, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. Isn't that amazing? You guys have no power against me, but just so you know, I'm giving myself willingly and obediently out of the will of my Father, not because I like what you're doing. Christ submitted Himself on Calvary. And the Scriptures say that He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. When He reviled, reviled not again. What He suffered, He threatened not. He committed to Himself, uh, to Him that judgeth righteously. 1 Peter 2.23 that being stated, we can draw several parallels about our submission as well when it comes to um, God, when it comes to our authorities over us. Just as Jesus was obedient to parents, we ought to be obedient to parents. Just as He was obedient to uh, the, the church and during this time, uh, synagogue, the practices, the Jewish feasts and so forth, we, we have an obedience to fulfill in, in the church. And just as He was obedient to the government, though they were as far from perfect. And if Christ could be obedient, we can be submissive as well and uh, to one another in the fear of the Lord. Let's, John chapter 6, verses 38 and 40 is where I started. And we consider doing the will of God. Uh, he didn't act independent of the Father. Everything was either said and done, and I've already mentioned this before, but was done in conjunction with God the, in, in the Father's, God the Father's will. And Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 30, uh, my judgment is just. Why? Because I seek not my own will, but the will of Him that sent me. In John chapter 5, verse 30. Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 34, My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me. It was said to the Spirit of God that led Him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And uh, that's beyond many's understanding. You mean the will of God for... For, for, for Christ Himself is to be led after He's been tempted for, or, or been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted of the devil in the wilderness? Yes, that was God's will. And so from anybody to say that it's not God's will for us to be tested and tried at times as God's uh, sons, again, would be a liar according to those verses. But He was tested in all points, and yet He came through faithfully, true, sinless in every single way. Uh, it was God's will for His Son, whom He loved, to go through those trials and troubles. Because it was God's will, Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. And thank God for that, for that woman at the well. They got saved by the grace of God, and there were several people to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through that. John 7.16, My doctrine is not mine, but His that sent me. John 8.47, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God, is what Jesus confronts the Pharisees with. And John 9.4, I must work the works of Him that sent me, while it is day, then I cometh when no man can work. And you understand that Jesus only did those miracles, again, that were directed of His Father. They talked about the man who was born blind in John chapter 9. Why was he born blind? That the works of God might be made manifest. 
Why did they cross the Sea of Galilee? Because they knew a man by the name of Legion, and they cast out those devils with God's will. Everything that he did, in perfect harmony and unity to God, was done according to the perfect will of God. Now, if I would get anything across to you, it's this. Time and time again, we find Jesus, and He's constantly down on His knees, and He's praying. If Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had to pray, and again, we find Him in the Garden of Gethsemane, He says, Not my will, but thine be done. We find Elijah, he's a man of much prayer, fervent in prayer. We find several other people in much prayer. I believe that the only way that we can be submissive, the way that we ought to, we need to be people of prayer. I'm not talking about casual prayer, but I'm talking about much prayer. Fervent prayer. Always praying. When it talks about selecting the twelve disciples, he was up all night praying. When it comes to, was it Luke chapter 11 or Luke chapter, I think it's Luke chapter 18 verse 1. It says, men are always to pray. And that's part of God's will, by the way. And that's part of being submissive to what God wants for us. And I believe it's the key. It's one of the most important things that you and I could do. He walked this earth as we walked. He, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Not only does He understand our temptations, but He shows us an example of perfect obedience. It says in 1 Peter 2.21, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow His steps. It's important for us to realize that key of prayer. The real test of submission is not when things are easy, right? The real test of submission is when you've been put through the trials and you're sitting there, you have a choice between, all right, is it my will? I know what I want. I want what's easy for the flesh. Is it between my will and I want the, the, the places of success, the places of position, the places of, can I just say it, pride? When I come to the, the place of trial and the place of the valley of decision between my will and God's will, uh, the, the, the way of submission, the way to understand whether I'm truly submissive or not, depends upon what choice I'm making. And though the strong is pulled because I love this flesh, and I believe it's true of every one of us, the strong, the, the pull is very strong, but when we lay down ourselves and when we lay down our will, when we lay down our rights and understand that I've been bought with a price, it's not about what I want, it's about what God wants and about fulfilling His will in my life and laying down my rights to pick up His will and following and serving in His light. Again, the flesh is real convincing, but we got to be filled with the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, and be much in prayer to fulfill that will in our lives. The same power that enabled Christ to submit to do the will of God will enable us. You know, want to know how I know that? It's because if we've been saved by the grace of God, we have Christ in us, the hope of glory, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Uh, here is what submission will do for us. Submission is key, as demonstrated through, through Jesus Christ and the life that He had lived. It's, it's key, vitally important, because... No matter the accusations that they threw against Christ, it wouldn't stick. No matter the, the, the things that they threw at Christ, none of them would hold. The trials that they faced, He was able to overcome. And when we submit ourselves to the will of God, though it may be hard and though it may be difficult at times, we realize that the, the obedience to the will of God helps my feet to be planted upon that solid rock to build our house to where the winds and the waves, they begin to beat and we're still able to stand. Why? Because we submitted ourselves to the will of God. It's not easy, but it's the best way for us. It's just like I, he started out with that, that eulogy of George Truett. He says, the will of God is sh sure, it's right, and it's what's best for us. Adam and Eve, when they fell, uh, they failed to realize that to follow God in submission was the best way for them. Submission to God will make your heart sing because of the unity and harmony that we're able to enjoy.
as not that the trials of life are not difficult. Hey, Christ was able to go through more difficulty than you and I will ever understand. We think that our life is hard. We think it's difficult. We think the trials are more than we can bear, but look at Christ. And yet he says in Hebrews chapter 12, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and the set down at the right hand of God, there was joy in his heart. And so he was able to sing, not because of what was going on around him, not because of the sin around him. In fact, there was times that he was grieved to the heart because uh, the ones who should have believed, the, the Jewish people, he says, uh, look at this, this, this centurion over here. This guy over here, he has more faith than all of you guys combined. He says, don't, don't even come under my roof. I'm a sinful man. He says, if you just speak the word, it'll be done. And there were times where he was grieved, but that singing because of that unity and harmony we, we are able to enjoy with, with God. And submission to God will build your relationship with Him to enjoy that close fellowship uh, as we've been studying in 1 John. I mean, I want to be able to say, I've been walking in the light. I want to be able to say I have fellowship with God. I want to be able to say that God's pleased with my life and what I've done. And so, when we come to the area of submission, we realize it's fundamental to everything that's said about being a believer in Christ. I mean, it's the key, it's foundational. Without this, without submission, I mean... It's dangerous ground is what I'm saying. And then submission to God will cure any legalism. You want to know why? Because it's not about doing my will. There's certain people that can go out and they would do all the religious duties and uh, yeah, they'll be baptized and to join a church and so forth and preach and do this, but it might not be true uh, of them. They might not truly be genuine slaves genuinely saved as we pointed out in Matthew chapter what is it 7 8 7 it says you know oh didn't we go out and prophesy in thy name and cast out devils and do many marvelous works in your name and depart from me I never knew you and they do all these works how, how they do it they're doing it out of legalism because they think that they're gaining merit and favor with God when they're, in fact they're doing quite the opposite they're only deceiving themselves blinding their own eyes and their own hearts and when we're submissive to God, there's no legalism in there. Because it's not my will. It's God's will. And everything... Look, when it comes to preaching and teaching upon the Word of God, and what's, the thing about it is, we're, we're to be conformed into the image of Christ. That's why I believe these lessons are so vitally important for Sunday school. His sonship is to be pictured in us. To be a son like as Christ was a son. And yes, He was obedient. I mean, the submission. It's not just to fill our heads full of knowledge. You might be thinking, well, why did you go through all of these things dealing with our responsibility and submission? Because it's not just enough to know about the submission of Christ. We understand that He was perfect in every way. It's not just to fill our minds. But I want you to be able to live it. I want to be able to live it. I want it to be real. I want it to be powerful. I want it to, to actually be said of our lives. And so, I pray every single Sunday school class that I bring to you, it challenges our hearts. It's not just to learn information. If Sunday school is all about that, then we failed. But it's all about being more like Christ and what He wants for us. Can we say with our lives, as it says George W. Truett, and again, you know, I don't know how embellished the words are, okay? But can it be said of me today, I didn't come here out of my will. I came here out of the will of God. I'm not uh, a father and, and, and a husband on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday out of my will. I'm doing it out of the will of God. Thy will be done in my life. Can we say that? Anybody have any comments or questions? Amen.
Yeah. The thing about what you say this morning, you know, what Proverbs got to do, chapter 14, verse 12, and verse uh, chapter 16, and verse 25, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end there are for the ways of death. Right. You know, we have to put our will aside. And sometimes that's hard. It is. And, and, and like you say, Lord, not my will, but your will. Amen. 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 I'm glad for that. Anybody else? Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer as we get ready for Sunday school or for preaching. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for trying our hearts. Lord, I pray that we'll be able to come forth as gold. Lord, I pray that we'll just take these words, internalize them, and Lord, uh, live them for Your glory. And I just thank You for the Son of God who was that example. And we're to be looking unto Jesus and help us to do that. Lord, I pray you be with me in the, the preaching service to follow. Lord, I pray you be with those coming in, that you would keep them safe. Lord, and I just pray you have your will and way in the church. Help us to submit our will to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.